thank you so much, Sue, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, hey, it's just great to be with you tonight here in Pebble Creek. My gosh, I walked into the room and I was just shocked at the energy. Like so many people, you promised a good crowd, but my goodness. And this is why I know that Republicans are going to win big in 2022. Because we're here, we're activated, we're pissed off. It's just so great to be with you. My name is Blake Masters. I'm running for the United States Senate because I don't know about you, but I'm in a mood to send Mark Kelly home. Oh. This guy, at least Kirsten Cinema, who's not a political ally, I don't trust her long term. At least she's sort of doing what she said. She said she'd be independent, she said she'd buck party leadership. Well, Mark Kelly said the same thing, and he's not doing that at all. He just votes in lockstep with Chuck Schumer. So we gotta send him home. I'm told that's to Tucson. Although I'm from Tucson, I'm also told Mark Kelly maintains his residence in Houston, Texas. So I don't know where home is for that guy. But I'm from Tucson, I grew up in Tucson. I met my wife in middle school in Tucson, if you can believe it. I remember the first time I saw her, she was wearing overalls, which I always uh, remind her about. She's very embarrassed by that. Uh, I was in eighth grade, she was in seventh grade. I, I, it's cliche, but I knew right away. I just did, we, we've been dating since high school. And uh, I live in Tucson. We have three beautiful boys. Apparently we can only make boys. And they're uh, seven, five, and one. They're, they're so, I'll show you pictures afterwards. But uh, I, you know, I, I worry a lot about the country that my kids are growing up in and on track to grow up in, right? And in some sense, I don't want to be too dramatic. My kids will be fine. I've had a successful business career. Uh, I manage a multi-billion dollar investment firm. And so I'm going to be able to take care of them. Food and shelter, at least until they're 18, and they'll kick them out. God bless them, right? And my wife and I homeschool these kids, you know, to prevent them from getting indoctrinated. Which is great. It's a real blessing to be able to do that. Not everyone can do that, so we do have to fix the schools. We'll talk about that. But in some sense, my boys will be fine. And yet I still worry about the country that they're going to grow up in, the country that your kids and your grandkids are growing up in. It just works much less well than the country I grew up in, which wasn't that long ago. It was the tail end of the 80s, Reagan's morning in America in the 1990s. Right? But we've actually had, since then, decades of failure. I think you see it in this botched withdrawal from Afghanistan. You also see it in the humiliating loss in Afghanistan, which wasn't just a crisis in the last month, it was a crisis 20 years in the making. I think you see it with our open border. We've had an open border, except for President Trump and his policies and that wall. We've had an open border for decades. And for decades, we've just watched as our middle class in this country has just been completely hollowed out. And I think the left has been driving that. But if we're honest with ourselves, it's not just the left. It's been Republican politicians too. Ever since Reagan, I think, I don't know about you, I think Reagan did his job. I think he was an amazing leader. I think he won the Cold War. He did what we needed him to do. But since then, with the notable exception of Donald Trump, I think most Republican politicians have botched it. What have we successfully conserved? Maybe George W. Bush is a good guy. I don't know, I've never met him. He's probably a fun guy to have a beer with. But we got Iraq. We got no child left behind. We got bank bailouts. And it's not like we got a whole lot of social conservatism or cultural conservatism. No, the left just rolled us. And so we're in a tough spot. I think the elite or the establishment or the ruling class or whatever you want to call it, They've been failing us for decades. And after decades of failure, I think it's crazy that what the establishment thought we needed in 2016 was another election between another Bush and another Clinton. That is crazy. And it's what we would have had <clears throat> if Donald Trump didn't step up and do what he did. And how amazing was that, right? How amazing was that? What a gift he gave us. And I have this crazy front row seat to it. So after, uh, after high school in Tucson, I went to Stanford. I went to Stanford Law School. And I started my career in Silicon Valley. Uh, I linked up with Peter Thiel. Uh, if you don't know Peter, Peter is the one outspoken conservative billionaire in Silicon Valley. 
Silicon Valley is probably actually 80% hyper left wing, maybe 20% conservative actually, but you wouldn't know it because the conservatives aren't allowed to say so. They have to hide. That's just the sort of Leninist political culture. But Peter, God bless him. Now he saw Trump come down the, the escalator, right? I remember watching some of the early debates with Peter and he just knew almost right away, that guy's different. That guy's gonna go the distance. And Peter's a pretty good investor. He's pretty good at uh, identifying talent in startups. And so he saw something in President Trump and we got involved with that campaign. I got to be a campaign surrogate for Trump in 2016. Uh, I got to help Peter write some speeches that were very influential. I think I coordinated some, some seven-figure donations to help President Trump. And I'll never forget election night. Do you remember how satisfying it was to see the New York Times meter, right? And I think right before, uh, before Florida came in, it was like 95% confident that Hillary was gonna win. And then we had this remarkable half hour, one of the top five half hours of my life. Uh, maybe my three kids being born, right? And then my wedding, and then maybe that one. <laughs> See that meter flip. It was amazing. And he won. And I, would, I have to confess, I was a little bit surprised by that. I think maybe even the Trump campaign was a little bit surprised by that. And I got to join the Trump transition team. And this was wild. So I spent most of my days between Election Day 2016 and Inauguration Day 2017 holed up in Trump Tower. Floor 14, you had all the, the resistance protesters outside already, right? I was right between Steve Mnuchin's office and Steve Bannon's office. And so, how can you imagine what that was like? I was in that, uh, that big tech meeting, or the, the tech meeting where Trump had Bezos come in, he had Sheryl Sandberg from Facebook come in, the Google guys, uh, and to see President Trump in action, it was, it was truly a pleasure, then President-elect Trump, but it was truly a pleasure. I got to see this man, who ran as a change agent, who was deadly serious about implementing his 2016 agenda. But then I also saw the chaos and dysfunction that happens in DC when you try to do that, right? We deploy these beachhead teams. We find some people to go into all the agencies, send four guys into the Department of Education to liaise with the Obama appointees to try to you know, have a smooth passing of the baton. Yeah, right. They did not want a smooth passing of the baton. Those people did everything they could to thwart us. They did not want any part of President Trump's America First agenda. And so that was a real education. I remember reading this book, Steering the Elephant, which was a, a memoir that a few Reagan appointees wrote, talking about how hard it was to implement Reagan's agenda in these agencies, right? And the civil service, the bureaucracy, that's only gotten 10x worse since the Reagan days. So I knew abstractly what we were up against, but it was another thing to see in practice with my own eyes, the whole DC machine rise up against us. And then internally at Trump Tower, there was a lot of conflict too, right? I think we have to be honest, acknowledge President Trump did not always, especially at the beginning, have himself surrounded by people who were truly committed to the agenda he ran on. So there was the Reince Priebus group, you know, there was the Steve Bannon group, Chris Christie, who thought he was running the transition. I mean, it was chaotic. But I saw the promise and the possibility of doing something new in government that wasn't just beholden to the traditional elite. And I also saw how much the machine hates that. So it was a real education. And now I feel like we're at a similar crossroads. Which way do we go? Which side predominates? Do we as Republicans go back to the party of Paul Ryan? <laughs> I don't think we can. If we lose this America first fight, I think the country's gone forever. Because the left, they control everything. For decades, we've just seen them take control of almost every institution in our society. Yeah, they have the White House now. They have the, the House of Representatives. They sort of have the Senate. Thank goodness it's more or less deadlocked. Because the left, they tell us what they will do if they take power. If they hold the House, and if they get a real majority in the Senate, it's all over. This isn't a conspiracy theory. They tell us this. They tell us we are going to add Puerto Rico to the union. We're gonna add Washington DC to the union. Do you think they care about these places? They don't care about them at all. What they care about are those two shiny Senate seats that they would get for each new state. They wanna pass S1, HR1, HR4. They wanna federalize elections. And if they do that, which they will, if they take power, if we let them do that, no Republican will ever win again. 
They want to ban states from being able to require voter ID. That's it, that's an existential threat. How many times have you heard the left brag about their plan to pack the Supreme Court? If they win in 2022, if they have enough senators to get this done, how many justices do you think we'll have on the Supreme Court in 2023? 13, could be 13. 23. If they need, it could be 40. Who knows? But it won't be nine. And that's game over. And say what you will about the left, I think it's a ghastly agenda that they're pursuing, but they have an affirmative agenda. And for too long, Republicans just have been playing defense. For my entire, I was gonna say adult life, but as far as I've been politically conscious, even in my teenage years, I just, I just saw Republicans playing defense, defense, defense until Trump. And defense has to be a good part of any strategy, but it's not enough. If you just play defense, and the left is playing offense, you will lose. Over time, maybe a little bit more slowly because you're putting up some resistance, but you will lose. And that's what we've been doing. But Trump knew in 2016, with the right affirmative agenda, you could win. He got out there and he told the truth about important issues that 60 or 70% of people agreed with that we know to be true, but that contravened the CNN narrative, right? You weren't allowed to notice publicly that our middle class had been hollowed out and the so-called free trade deals that Republicans had been preaching for decades didn't work. What if there's no free trade with China? If you think you've got free trade with China, you're probably just at the negotiating table getting completely demolished, patting yourself on the back. Meanwhile, China, is they've got their thumb on the scale. They're subsidizing their domestic industry. They're undercutting us every which way. There's no free trade with China. Trump understood that. He understood that we needed law and order he knew that that started at the southern border and how quick a contrast we've seen in these last eight months. I'm not saying that it was perfect in December of 2020 before Trump left office. It wasn't perfect, but it was pretty darn good. He built that wall. It was working. Biden and Harris gets in office, reverses all the policies and practically invite people to come here. And guess what? If you do that, they will. Biden totally ceded the entire Southwest border to the cartels. These are criminal trafficking organizations. Now we have more than 200,000 people coming here illegally every month. That's a run rate of more than 2 million people per year. That should out, I know it outrages you, it outrages me. And that's just a policy failure, but that's what the left wants. Trump knew that you'd be, he, he knew he would get hit by saying this. He knew that when he said build the wall, he would take so many arrows from the media, and he did, and he was willing to do it for this country. And that's the kind of affirmative agenda we need. And so this is why I'm running. I, I really, everyone always says, this election is the most important election of my lifetime. Right, how many times have we heard that? But this time it really is existential. It's 2022 and 2024. If we don't take back this Senate seat, if we don't take back the U.S. Senate, I think it's all over. Do you remember what Benjamin Franklin said? Maybe this is apocryphal, I think it actually happened. He was walking into one of the meetings at the Constitutional Convention, and a woman said, you know, Mr. Franklin, what kind of government do we have? Because remember, it could have gone any which way. They could have decided, hey, the English monarchy was bad, but we'll try a different version of it here at home. It could have gone any different way. But he said, a republic, ma'am if you can keep it. And these don't come along every decade, but I feel like we're at this moment now where it's an if you can keep it moment. This is the question, can we keep it? But here's what gives me hope. It's the energy in this room. It's the fact that the left has gone too far too fast. It's the fact that Mark Kelly, this time, has a track record. He's voting against completing the border wall. He's voting for mass amnesty. I mean, this stuff is bonkers. We are right on the issues. People don't want critical race theory in their schools. People don't want to defund the police. We want more police. We gotta take better care of our police. People see, you see the nationwide crime epidemic that's happening right now. It's because so many big Democrat run cities legalize crime. In San Francisco, I can steal your iPhone. And because it's less than one or $2,000, there's not a darn thing the police can do about it. And then you see the violent crime spike up. I mean, this is really dark and scary stuff, but 60 or 70% of people agree with us on this stuff. 
And so if we run the right candidates on the right message, I think we clean up in 2022. And here's the trick, and this is a little paradoxical. It should be a really good environment for us next year, right? Nobody in this room thinks that Biden's gonna turn around and get better in the next 15 months, right? I mean, it's sad because we see the damage that's happening. It's laughable. We see the damage that's happening to our country and that's horrible to watch. But gosh, it kind of makes you feel like we're gonna crush it in 2022. Well, here's the thing. We need to have that kind of optimism and then not get too complacent about it. I really caution against thinking that there's gonna be some red wave. Because if we think that, we will get complacent and we will not do the hard work that it takes to win. And I think it's gonna be hard. I think some of my opponents say, I'm gonna crush Mark Kelly, this is gonna be easy. No, I'm gonna beat Mark Kelly, but it's gonna be hard. I think it's gonna take something very fresh and very new to dislodge him. He's gonna raise between 100 and $150 million for this race. That's a lot of money. He's already raising six, seven million bucks a month, almost on autopilot. The Democrats are really good at this stuff. But I can tell you what, he does not want to debate me. Because what a contrast that will be. He gets up and says the most banal stuff. He's just a politician. It's amazing how good at being a normal politician he is because he's never done it before. But he gets up and he says, I'm going to roll up my sleeves and make the best decisions for Arizonans. Yeah. Like, okay, Mark, well, okay, what do you think about the filibuster? He's like, very good question. I'm going to roll up my sleeves and make the best decision possible for Arizona. He won't tell you what he thinks because I'm not sure he has any thoughts at all. Well, I got a lot of thoughts. And I think people are sick and tired of hearing from cookie cutter candidates that only know how to parrot out what consultants tell them because that's what's safe. I don't think that works anymore. I think Republicans have gotten very complacent. We run cookie cutter archetypes of candidates. I think the guys I'm competing against are good guys, but I also think you've got a politician who checks the way the wind blows every time he makes a decision. I think you've got a business guy. I think he's a good business guy. I think you've seen the business guy candidate many times before in history. I have a business background too, but I think I, I hope I sound very different. If I sound like a normal politician, just tell me, and I'll just let one of those guys take it. I'll, you know. It's gonna take something very new. We've got a military candidate. I know General McGuire. I think he's a good man. We spent time together at these events on the campaign trail. I think he's good. I don't think, you know, I hear a lot of people saying, well, it takes a general to beat an astronaut. And I'm like, we tried this with Martha McSally. She was a fantastic military resume. It doesn't work. You have to understand the enemy. And the enemy here, we talked about enemies foreign and domestic. I'm sorry to say it, but this modern, far left, progressive activist class that's running the Democratic Party, I think they're a domestic enemy. I think they're a threat to everything we do. And all of life. And I grew up with these people. I know how these people think. The people in charge of the Biden administration, it's not Joe Biden. We know that. I don't think he knows what time it is. I almost feel bad for him, but not because he knew he just wanted the power. But I'll tell you who's running the administration. It's people my age. It's the people I went to school with at Stanford Law School and Yale and Harvard and that whole complex. I know how progressive millennials think. I know what we're up against, and I think it's existential. It's why I think my relative youth is actually such an asset in this race. I will sound so different, and it's not just style, it's also substance. And let me hammer that home with one concrete point, and then I wanna close and take questions. Big tech. Every candidate in this race on the GOP primary has learned that you gotta be against big tech, right? So everyone's got their consultants writing them lines. Big tech censorship is bad, and I'm gonna put an end to it. That's what they all say. Well, it's like, I know big tech. I've lived it. I worked in Silicon Valley. I know the people who run these companies. I know the rank and file engineers at Facebook and Twitter and Google. And I think the problem, there's a lot of problems, but I think they're all 10 or 15 times worse than we think. And we all think it's a problem. You've heard of section 230? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine, it's boring, it's legalistic. I think we focus too much on it. It basically just means that right now the big tech companies hide behind being platforms. 
They want to say, you can't hold us responsible for the content on our platforms. What platforms? Well, no, they actually have their thumb on the scale. They're deciding what to censor. They're acting like publishers. And so we should repeal Section 230 immunity to treat them like publishers. We absolutely should do that. But that is like one or two percent of how hard we need to go. I think we ought to treat these companies like common carriers. Like the phone company can't kick you or I off because we have a conversation in support of President Trump or because we're talking about the Arizona audit. They can't do it. They're banned by law from doing that. So why shouldn't we hold Facebook or Twitter to the same standard? We absolutely should. And then I think we gotta go farther still. Republicans have a rich history with antitrust. And we gotta break these companies up. I really feel like it's come to that. Now, five years ago, a room like this would have said, Blake, who are you to say how big a business can get? And fair enough, I'm a pro-market guy. I want businesses to succeed wildly. But at a certain point, when a business becomes more powerful than most governments, when it works with the White House to censor what information you're allowed to read, when it becomes worth a trillion dollars and it has a political point of view and it's threatening to swing an election, I think we can afford to treat that business differently than we might treat a local bakery or a hair salon. And we gotta do it. And you know, the, the antitrust laws may need updating because they were written 100 years ago for very different contexts when we were worried about price gouging, right? A rail, there can only be one railroad and what happens if that railroad jacks up prices? Well, here's the thing, Facebook doesn't charge you to use its product, you are the product. And so wouldn't it be nice to have smart young people who actually understand this stuff to get in and hold these companies accountable? Yeah. And then I go one step farther still, the fundamental business model here, targeted advertising. I don't think anyone really has a concrete idea just how much data these companies suck up on all of us. It really is shocking. In some spiritual sense, yeah, your, your, your husband or wife knows you more than anybody, but actually Google, probably knows more about you than your spouse in some really cold and dark ways. The, the, the models that these companies can build, they know where you are, they know who you're talking to, they know what you're talking about. How many times have you been talking to, I don't know, your son-in-law or something about going camping and then five minutes later you see an ad for tents on Facebook or something, right? It's kind of funny, it's kind of funny, but I think it's kind of funny because it's a code because we don't want to think about how sick and disgusting it is. This is really predatory stuff. And how many times have you been to Applebee's and you see a family with young children and they ought to be having a family conversation, but they're not because every kid is just glued to an iPad. And the executives of Apple, the executives who are making the software running on that iPad, they don't let their own kids play with iPads. They give them handmade toys from Sweden. They recognize this stuff is really addictive. When we found out how addictive cigarettes were, we sprang into action. Maybe we overcorrected a little bit, but we still did something about it. We at least recognize that casinos and gambling are some kind of vice requiring regulation to protect consumers. But big tech right now, it's laissez-faire. It's just go ahead and screw people over. I, I'm tired of this, and they use the monopoly profits from that incredibly effective advertising. They use it for political purposes. Who in this room doubts that Google would like to swing a presidential election? Well, who's to say they didn't? I don't know. I don't want to make a baseless claim, but I don't have access to Google's uh, changes in their, in their master search algorithms. Neither do you, and neither does our government. I think that's a problem, at least when Facebook pulls the Hunter Biden story off the internet the week before the election. At least, at least that's transparent and we can get outraged about it, even though we were silent, at least people talk about that. But how crazy is that? The New York Post, founded by Alexander Hamilton, that's a real newspaper, the story was factually true, and Facebook decided that right before this 2020 election, hundreds of millions of Americans couldn't read about it. I think that's crazy. I hope you can tell I'm passionate about this issue. I hope you can tell I know what I'm talking about here. Have you seen these tech hearings? where some of our US senators, God bless them, are some of the nicest people you'll ever meet, but they're also in their late 70s. And they get Zuckerberg on the hot seat. And what an opportunity that is. And the questions are just completely flubbed. I mean, he's a smart guy. He'll run circles around people who aren't deadly serious about what they're talking about. And Facebook's stock price goes up 
after the hearings, because Wall Street looks at it and just says, no one's gonna touch these companies. I think if we don't regulate big tech in the right way, we have no meaningful First Amendment in just two or three years, and then it's all over. And that's just one threat we have. I think we face threats everywhere. So you've gotta get smart, competent people who recognize the existential threats we face. And that's why I'm running. It's 2022, 2024, I really think we can take back the country. We have to. And so we will. It's just that simple. Thank you for having me here. I love you.